Good evening, everybody. My name is Bert Dicht. I am the Managing Director of Membership for the National Space Society. And on behalf of Larry Ahern, Vice President of Chapters, uh, welcome to our Space Forum this evening. The topic, the past 200 years of space tourism. And I'll be doing more to introduce this topic and our speaker uh, in just a couple of minutes. As always, we'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules uh, to join our series of space forums and town halls. We really enjoy having you here and we hope you'll enjoy tonight's session. I always like to start off with a little thing on etiquette, virtual etiquette. Then I'll go into some announcements. We've got uh, a list of our upcoming space forums and then we'll get right into the program and then we'll close out for the evening. So in terms of our virtual etiquette, it's really more about asking questions. Uh, please feel free to submit a question using the Q&A function. Uh, that typically is easier for the panelists to pull the questions out because it's typically just questions. But feel free also to use the chat function to submit a question. But I do ask that everybody be respectful of the panelists and the audience uh, because everyone can see those if you don't submit them directly uh, to the uh, panelists. So we always do pretty well with that, and hopefully we'll do that again tonight. And I will be talking a little bit about the questions in just a minute. Uh, another big announcement, and we're probably going to be doing a town hall coming up on the ISDC, our International Space Development Conference 2023, A New Space Age. This is coming up, believe it or not, really fast, uh, coming up May 25th to 28th. Uh, and at the Embassy Suites Hotel in Frisco, Texas, just north of Dallas. It's a really great location. Uh, we hope you can join us for that. There are sessions on the moon, space settlement, interplanetary infrastructure, space development, many roads to space, Mars, and a whole lot more. We get a lot in there. Some of our featured, our featured speakers are Dr. Are Dr. Bonnie Dunbar, retired astronaut, and now a professor at Texas A&M. You probably know Jared Isaacman who uh, commanded the uh, Inspiration4. He's gonna be doing the uh, Polaris Dawn mission coming up. Dr. Pasco Lee from the Mars Institute, Dylan Taylor from Voyager Space, uh, Dr. David Livingston from the Space Show, uh, and Janet Ivey, one of our governors, who's the president of Explore Mars. Those are just a few of the great speakers we have coming up at ISDC 2023. So uh, for more information, go to that website. I can post that uh, in the chat as well. And we hope to see you there. It's gonna be another great ISDC coming up. And as I said, we'll, we'll actually have a session on this uh, coming up uh, in probably in April, a specific town hall dedicated to the ISDC. As always, I'd like to encourage you to give to our cause. If you're enjoying these programs, uh, we would really appreciate your support. I thank all of those people and members, uh, other supporters who've donated in the past, and thank you for those who are donating in the future. We really appreciate the help and the support. As always too, I ask you to complete our post space forum survey. It only takes a couple of minutes to complete. Uh, and it's, it's uh, you know, it really, really helps us in terms of planning. Uh, the future events. So we really appreciate that. Uh, so we look forward to your comments and so on uh, as the uh, session ends. It's anonymous. It'll come up right after the session closes. Uh, coming up, we're still pulling together the rest of our schedule. Uh, this is what it looks like over the next few weeks. So I do invite you to come back on the 23rd uh, with you here, Dr. Maria Kuhlman, who's talking about a healthy space. Uh, she was our space health contest winner in 2022. Uh, and uh, we've got a lot of great things uh, being planned. Uh, I hope by next time on the 23rd, we'll be able to give you a more long-term schedule, which is really what we're trying to do. So keep an eye out for that and uh, more to come. So now it's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce our program and our speaker for this evening. And the topic is the past 200 years of space tourism. And our speaker, Bill Bradshaw, you might remember Bill. Bill, Bill actually spoke 
at one of our space forums uh, a couple years ago on uh, space stations in popular culture. And what he does, he really brings together incredible photographs and artwork uh, to illustrate these concepts. The topic, of course, today is past the past 200 years of space tourism. Uh, I will say a number of you submitted questions when you registered, but your questions, a number of them were looking forward as to what the future of space tourism is and what's happening now. Bill's not going to be addressing that. Bill's talking about the evolution of space tourism in our popular culture, in science. Uh, and again, it's a fascinating, fascinating history that actually really goes back uh, more than 200 years. So I think you're really going to enjoy it. Uh, Bill is a retired science museum professional, more than 42 years uh, in the science uh, museum business. Uh, he is a lifelong space enthusiast. Uh, and historian, and he does actually teaches some courses at local universities related to some of these topics. So I know you're in for a really enjoyable presentation tonight. So Bill, it is my pleasure to turn things over to you, uh, and we can get right into the presentation. And just before Bill speaks, uh, his presentation will probably take us to about 10 p.m. Eastern time, and then we'll be doing questions after that, everybody. So, Bill, it's all yours. Okay. I just have to get, uh, here we go. There we go. You see it? Perfect. So, uh, Willie Lay of uh, the uh, German American uh, space scientist uh, had this quote ideas like large rivers never have just one source. And what I would suggest tonight, and what I want to share with you tonight, is how this, this concept of space tourism has uh, multiple sources in history. But first, we probably need to define tourism. Uh, and I look on it more broadly than you might. Uh, travel to distant locations, either in person, that's the obvious tourism, or vicariously through books, lectures, art, and media. Very few of us are going to actually travel in space, and yet we vicariously uh, look forward to doing that through this combination of media. And what I want to do is share with you examples of that over the past actually 2,000 years. But just as an example, Marco Polo was a great traveler, right? He was a great tourist, and yet very few people toured with him. And yet he wrote books when he came back, sharing his enthusiastic experiences. And through the 1800s and 1900s, uh, books like this, A Thousand Miles Up the Nile, uh, by a, a, a woman uh, who was an adventurer and uh, apparently nicely illustrated her adventures up the Nile. Uh, Captain Cook's Voyages, uh, were written up and illustrated. And then you can see that there are just a multitude of these kinds of books. So literature is one way in which we can vicariously explore space. And actually 2000 years ago, Lucian of Semisot uh, wrote a book called The True History, and it described a trip to the moon. Uh, his spaceship was actually a boat that was picked up by a whirlwind out of the ocean and carried to uh, the moon. Cyrano de Bergerac wrote several books in the mid 1600s uh, where he went to the moon uh, to explore primarily looking for things that were uh, examples of what not to do on planet Earth, uh, critiques, if you will. Uh, he used, uh, in the end book, uh, a rocket uh, attached to a capsule. You can see an illustration there uh, to accomplish his journey. And then uh, Johannes Kepler in 1634 uh, wrote Samanen, uh, The Dream 
uh, and a lot of people consider it to be the first science fiction. Uh, he not only went to the moon, he populated the moon with lunar beings. Uh, so again, primarily with words, uh, we've been able to travel, but then along comes uh, Jules Verne and his publisher, and his publisher uh, set out to broadly illustrate uh, Verne's 54 different novels. And the illustrations are truly breathtaking uh, to, uh, to, to explore the topic. So I think that at Verne's book, starting in the uh, 1867, really set a mark for uh, space exploration uh, in a vicarious sense. And these are just some illustrations from from those two books. You know the story with the, the cannon and being shot to the moon. And uh, what's fascinating to me about the book is that it, it's written in tremendous detail uh, and it inspired people like Werner von Braun uh, to ex get involved with space, space exploration. Uh, here's a burial from the spacecraft. One of the uh, companion dogs died, so they set it adrift. And then, of course, this is the classic image. On the uh, right is uh, the uh, Apollo capsule being recovered in the uh, Pacific Ocean. And on the left is an illustration from Verne's book uh, where his capsule is, in fact, recovered off the coast of California. A person, a French astronomer, uh, continued that, not so much with storylines, but with uh, highly detailed experimental looks at other planets. And uh, he, he looked at uh, uh, a lot of Venus and Mars and created these uh, scenic scapes that could take us uh, to those distant places. Uh, this is an 1880 publication uh, and a look at the Earth from the moon. And then you have the 1930s and 40s. And I know many of you have seen the uh, covers for these pulp science fiction, but you may not have had the chance to see the insides. And it's striking how the artists created inside the covers of these books uh, worlds that we could go uh, explore. Uh, so I think you can see that uh, opening up the book uh, to look on the inside uh, is certainly worth, worth doing. Uh, but in the 30s and 40s, uh, these books uh, were readily available for those interested in the topics and uh, could be purchased for 25 cents or less and uh, could take you to a lot of very distant uh, places and wonderful storylines. Then uh, in, in the 50s, uh, magazines such as Coronet, uh, this is an article that called Mr. Smith Goes to Venus, and it was illustrated by Chesley Bonstell. So it's interesting that a magazine like Coronet had an interest in space and then hired a highly successful uh, illustrator to in fact illustrate the story of a person taking his family to Venus. Uh, on the left, you see the uh, kinds of plant material they found, and on the right, uh, a, a lost civilization on Venus. Now, we know this isn't feasible, this isn't accurate, but it stretched people's imaginations. Then in the 50s and early 60s, there, there were a number of youth books oriented towards the youth that have striking illustrations. This is by Spaceship to the Moon, uh, written by Willie Lay, but 
illustrated by Jack Coggins. This is rocket satellites and space travel. Uh, the artwork in these is truly exceptional and takes you to these locations uh, far earlier than it was feasible to think about going. A lot of these books I've purchased on Abe Books uh, through the years, and they're still available uh, for a reasonable price. Willie Lay did a series of space uh, books for, for young people. Uh, this particular book is uh, from the British uh, publication, and you notice the foreword is by Arthur C. Clarke. So through literature, we, we went from just words to describe what we were seeing to these wonderful illustrations as well, starting with Verne and going up to contemporary times. And then between 1952 and 54, Collier's Magazine ran a seven part series about space exploration. And you can see the people involved down here around that table. You can see Willie Lay, Werner von Braun, Chelsea Bunstell on the right. Uh, so not only did they have space enthusiasts and space science and engineering people, they had a wonderful collection of illustrators. And this is what you get by combining the two. That's inside of a space station. On to the moon. Now, uh, Von Braun certainly thought large uh, expeditions to the moon, um, not, not financially viable today, but uh, still mind stretching. And then Life Magazine through the 40s and 50s did have an interesting set of of art. Uh, this one, uh, the covers by Chesley Bonstell, this is 1954. And inside it, it showed Mars on the right and uh, looks like uh, Mercury on the left there and Saturn. And then interestingly, in, 19, in 1843, a newspaper in Philadelphia published a, a totally fabricated story. Uh, and this became the, the great moon hoax. Uh, it, the writer said that a famous astronomer working in South Africa had seen uh, beings on the moon and uh, set out to illustrate them. And this story got picked up by major newspapers around the world. And each newspaper uh, tended to add its own illustrations, stretching, stretching the truth, but taking you to the moon in a way that really probably inspired a lot of people. So that's the print material. And you could bring it more up to date, but I want to now go to uh, in-person presentations. This is a wonderful illustration of an orrery lecture in 1766. And right and left at the bottom, you see orreries. But here, I think you can get a sense for how a lecture can enthrall a small group of people with the story of our, of our uh, solar system and beyond. And then in the 1800s, magic lanterns, projections systems, uh, some of them being quite elaborate, like the one on the lower right, uh, were used by lecturers to present stories to larger audiences. And some of them used automated slides. And you can see some illustrations here of how the mechanism was built into what was projected so that it could move. And here are a collection of those kinds of astronomical topics that were automated. So as they were being projected, as the lecturer was telling the people that what he wanted them to understand, he could illustrate it in a way that was more captivating. Then in um, 1892 through 94, a trip to the moon, uh, was a stage performance that was brought to Carnegie Hall Music Hall. It was a 90 minute presentation and offered three days per week for two years. Now, what that involved 
was using stagecraft, stage lighting, theatrical effects, magic lantern projections, and canvas panoramas. And you can see some of the apparatus down here on the lower right to create scenes that would take you elsewhere in the solar system. Starting off with Earth, they had a sunrise above a lake. You have to imagine the lake shimmering. These are, these are photographs of, illust of illustrations that were in the Scientific American magazine at the time. Here's sunrise and Earth light. So all of that would have been produced on a wide, wide stage in a three-dimensional way, making use of stagecraft. It must have been uh, exciting for the public to see, because as I said, it ran for two years. And if it wasn't drawing an audience, it would not have lasted for more than a few months. One of the highlights of it is a solar eclipse as viewed from the moon by using the stage footlights and the special effects built into the uh, canvas backing, they were able to show the eclipse taking place and the lighting changing into the reddish glow that would have been created by the Earth's atmosphere as the sunlight passed through it. And here's a view of the Earth from the moon. Now I submit to you that that's a form of tourism. That's a way of taking people somewhere that we could not go on our own. But perhaps you think more along the lines of physical rides. So I wanna remind you about some cyclorama technology, and I'm gonna then show you how it was applied in 1901 uh, to a rather amazing ride for the times. Cyclorama is paintings on canvas that can be brought into view. Uh, this is a, a cyclorama that included people sitting on a ship. The ship was moved so that it, it uh, rocked and they were looking at the sides, waves and so forth. Or here is a cyclorama of a horse race where the horses are not moving, but rather the background is moving. These were used to illustrate war scenes. In Atlanta, there's a large uh, cyclorama uh, of the Battle of Atlanta. But in 1901, at the Pan American Exposition, the two gentlemen created a experience for the amusement section of this World's Fair uh, that was tremendously successful. And it was called A Trip to the Moon. And uh, what I've tried to do is collect some images that would give you a sense of what the voyage was like. This is the building that it took place in, Trip to the Moon. You can see it's not a small thing. This is an artist's rendering of what the craft might have looked like. It had wings that would flap, propulsion. It had uh, places where people could sit. This is the image, uh, one of the images presented for uh, copyright purposes. And you can see on the left, people would enter, go across a bridge, find seats on those little round locations, and then the voyage would take place. At the end, after they reached the moon, and landed on the moon, people would exit to the right. And this is a voyage to the moon. Now this is looking from the side end, and you can see the wings, the flaps uh, on the right and left, and then the canopy on top, and people were sitting between them. Notice that the whole thing is suspended off of a central column, and it's suspended by way of cables, which means that people underneath could make this whole mechanism with 50 or 60 people rock as though it was turning right or turning left. Wind would blow in your face. There was dramatic lighting. The, chain, the scenes changed by way of cyclorama technology, flapping wings and small scale ground models. The story went like this. Our ship lifts off 
from the fairgrounds. And we can leave the fairgrounds behind as we move away from Buffalo. Below us, the city of Buffalo on the left, Niagara Falls on the right. As we traverse, our ship bends a little to the left, rocks a little to the left, and we look down on Niagara Falls using the cyclorama technology. We enter a thunderstorm as we rise higher towards the moon. And here's a little illustration, a video that gives you a sense of what it was like to take this little voyage. Now the moon is in sight. And here's the layering of scenes. So this goes a little fast, but this gives you an idea of how they could layer what they were seeing. So you have the audience on the right, the wings, and then the moonscape. As we grow closer to the moon, uh, the moon rises above us. We actually land on the moon and we descend into the caverns of the moon and we meet the selenites that are living in, the, <coughs> in those caverns. We go to the palace of the moon man. <coughs> so this was a very elaborate experience. It included a stage show underneath and of course a souvenir shop. Now, does any of that bring to thought Disney World or Disneyland or any of our modern kinds of amusements? This was so successful that in the six month run, it, it had 400,000 guests. Its gate receipts were $200,000 which adjusted for inflation is $6.2 million. It was so successful that the owners took it to um, Coney Island and over the next 30 years built a theme park and operated a theme car park called Luna Park, which included the moon, which eventually became a trip to Mars, which eventually also included Voyage 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea all done with the same kinds of technology. <coughs> and here's some pictures of Luna Park. Then you have the 1939 World's Fair. You might think, well, did that look to the future? And yes, it did. Inside of the ball was this huge model of a city of the future. General Motors had this amazing exhibition, uh, which you rode through on, uh, I'll show you the way you rode through it, right here on these <clears throat> chairs. Uh, and it took you past a huge model of a future city. Uh, you can see on the lower right, uh, one of the workmen installing one of the buildings. So you can get a sense of the scale of this. So Futurama, but in the transportation building, a different building, uh, Raymond Lowry, a famous designer, had designed this space cannon. If you look closely at the lower right, you can see the silhouette of some people to give you an idea of the scale of this exhibition. Uh, this was a 10, 15 minute story with a demonstration of how the cannon could send things into orbit. And then I just recently ran across this. The American Museum of Natural History at the fair had a, a theater of time and space, which took people to the planets, nebula, and beyond. Uh, not everything was built. Uh, popular science typically has things that are still on the thought stage. <coughs> this is a, a combination of a ride and a uh, planetarium, uh, but you can certainly see how that idea has evolved into some of the rides we see 
at, at Disney World. Uh, Macy's actually had a magic carpet ride to Mars uh, sometime in the late 30s. I haven't been able to find any photographs of it, but this is an ad uh, for, for it. Okay, then Disneyland in 1955 uh, had a flight to the moon. Uh, the rocket ship is illustrated here, and it had a place for passengers. Uh, and the story was that you would go into the rocket ship, you would sit there, and there was a screen in the foreground, on, in the floor, and above your head that would take you on a trip to the moon. And here you can see a, uh, a drawing showing how the uh, projection screen and the upper was used with the floor screen. Now I've put together a little video. Uh, here is Walt Disney uh, explaining this particular ride. Popular attractions here is our simulated rocket trip around the moon. After entering the Disneyland spaceport, visitors may experience the thrills that space travelers of the future will encounter when rocket trips to the moon become a daily routine. An iconic attraction that would take guests into outer space in a V-2 rocket across the stars and around the moon and safely back home again. The attraction was called Rocket to the Moon and it was the first of its kind. As you step inside the launch pad, cast members would select your lunar rocket. You are either on Moonliner Luna or Moonliner Diana, later changed to Arcturus and Polaris. Once inside, guests would be loaded into a round theater and seated around two large screens, one on the floor and one on the ceiling, with a giant rumble created by out-of-balance air-driven motors underneath the theater. The rocket took off toward the moon, with the upper screen showing their destination and the lower screen showing where the rocket had been. Riders would see themselves propel above Disneyland, watching Anaheim disappear behind the clouds and soon found themselves in outer space. As the rocket made a... Now, as our rocket went around the moon, it shot down flares that lighted up the moon. Now, in this case, we didn't land on the moon. However, watch what they find on the moon. It looks a little suspicious there, like there might be some aliens visiting the moon. And then we return to our space. Finally, the rocket made a return trip, touching down safely in tomorrow. Just outside the launch pad, you can see the enormous red and white. So this uh, was 1955, uh, five or six years after it became a, a trip to Mars. Um, and then we have 1983 uh, Horizons at Disney, uh, which included a major section devoted to space exploration. And it included a large uh, IMAX dome projection system into which they had built three-dimensional models of a space settlement being assembled and being operated. Here's a little video. progressed, you got to see a, uh, a, a space home where uh, the mother was trying to convince the child uh, to come down uh, since they were in zero gravity. 
And then of course there's Space Mountain. I remember an interview years ago with a Russian cosmonaut saying that a ride on Space Mountain was harder on him than going into space. It's so jerky. And then of course, Disney now has uh, Star Wars rides, several of them available. And it has a, a Buzz Lightyear ride. <clears throat> and then of course the Mission Space ride with a trip to Mars <clears throat> and using large centrifugal uh, technology, they were able to create probably up to two Gs uh, during the, the ride. New York World's Fair, 1965, had a huge exhibition area about space exploration. And you can see that it was very comprehensive. But inside of this building was a three-dimensional presentation of a spacecraft docking with a space station. <coughs> and General Motors did Futurama again. And I have a little video <coughs> showing the space aspect of- Futurama 2. Welcome to a journey into the future, a journey for everyone today into the everywhere of tomorrow. Let us explore together the future, a future not of dreams, but of reality. It is now tomorrow. On the moon, there is no air to breathe, no rain to fall, no sound that can be heard. Yet here is man exploring, building his first bridgehead in his span of space. Lunar rovers float magically over powdered plains, range the crater's edge, their elastic train-like bodies conforming to every surface character of the moon. Here are bases of communication and supply, islands of existence built to withstand the melting heat of the lunar day the shattering cold of the lunar night. Men in space now monitor the Earth, while men on Earth are finding a whole new world. So I think a few of us are going to get a chance to go to the moon, except through this vicarious tourist experience. And then there was the World's Fair in Montreal, Canada called Expo 67, which went the hardware route this is Buckminster Fuller's almost fully geodesic bubble inside of which the United States had its exhibition and it featured the Apollo program and other space programs of that time. I did have an opportunity to go to this fair and this particular pavilion was outstanding. <clears throat> Not to be outdone, the Soviets had their own pavilion uh, and this is it. And inside of it, they had on display all of their accomplishments in space exploration. <clears throat> then in the cinema, I've, I'm sure you've all seen the 1902 film, but I wanna remind you <coughs> that this film was the first science fiction film, the first space travel film, the first film to visit another world and the first to depict aliens. And it was really the first film that had a plot and storyline. Here's a little excerpt from it. It was produced in black and white, but uh, Georges Mallet, the, the producer and special effects wizard of it, uh, also employed uh, people to hand color each individual frame, and it was released in color uh, as well as in black and white. So our capsule is being loaded inside of our gun. You'll note the storyline here is Jules Verne's ideas of going to the moon by way of a gun. 
and roughly the first half of the movie is based on Verne's books. This is a classic image I'm sure you've seen with the moon getting the capsule in the eye. Here is the capsule landing on the moon. I think, I think it's landing. Oh no, this is Earthrise. This is, uh, this is Earthrise from the moon. Then our intrepid astronauts go down into the caverns of the moon. And here the storyline becomes H.G. Wells' first man in the moon and our intrepid Taurus encounter lunar cellulites, moon creatures. and a little special effects from cinematography. <clears throat> and here comes a selenite. And I would suggest the earth people didn't were not very nice guests. Then in 1929, a German film done by Fritz Lang, Woman in the Moon. Here's a view of the rocket ship, somewhat reminiscent of uh, Apollo, the ship coming out of the vehicle assembly building, working its way to the launch pad. After launch on the way to the moon, they depict weightlessness. And here's what the moon surface itself looked like. This was a large town stage with a uh, background. Now, fortunately for our intrepid tourists, uh, the moon had an atmosphere. Well, the science fiction stuff's not always accurate. Soviet Union in 1936 produced this film. The technical advisor was. Uh, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, the great theoretical um, physicist who, who came up with a lot of the basic concepts of rocketry. So he was the technical advisor for this film. And this is a little section of the showing you the rocket. The young man stows away uh, and uh, goes on the flight to the moon. The scale of this is all done with models, not with computer generated graphics of today.
this is what the surface of the moon is presented to look like. So cinema has taken us to these distant locations for over a hundred years, 1902. One of my favorite films, Destination Moon, 1950, Chesley Bonstell was the uh, graphic artist who uh, laid out the moonscape and this is what it looked like in the film. We've landed on the moon. Our astronauts are getting their first view of the lunar surface. Now you might very well say to yourself, I wish it looked like that because we know the moon surface is very much rolling hills rather than sharp peaks. But some people say, this is the way the moon should have been, even if it turned out not to be. Mission to Mars, uh, a, a Disney film back in the year 2000, does an exceptionally good job of presenting the Martian surface. So if you haven't seen that film, look it up. I think you'll enjoy the storyline, as well as the technology of the presentation. Now, I just ask you to think about what your favorite films are. I know 2001, A Space Odyssey, 2010, uh, you know, your, your, your own personal choice. Now, we have a few minutes left, and I thought I would share with you some uh, observations on my part as to why you might want to go into orbit. Why would you want to go uh, into space? And uh, one of the things is certainly the opportunity to look back on the earth. And we have astronauts explaining how that is breathtaking. And uh, you can see some of these illustrations. Uh, these are actual photographs from the cupola of the International Space Station. By the way, the Smithsonian Air and Space Museums the new exhibits includes a full-size replica of the cupola with appropriate video projections so that you can be looking out the cupola at Earth. You can see swirling storms, great clouds. Here's a hurricane with the eye of the storm clearly visible. We got to see some some interesting things up there. This you is know, time one lapse was view. Hurricane Dorian, a Category Five hurricane with uh, you know, such a well formed eye. So as we design our space hotels, I do trust that they're including cupolas and other ways that we'll be able to look down on planet Earth. This is, uh, these are some images of sunrises and sunsets. You get one every, what, 90 minutes or so. It's also helpful to think of the atmosphere. That thin blue line is our atmosphere that we continue to pollute and mistreat. But this is a time lapse of a sunrise from the ISS. And there's that thin blue line of the atmosphere. Aurora Borealis from, from the International Space Station. So these might be phenomena certainly worth the trip up there. Turns out that uh, the astronauts say that uh, on the dark side of your orbit, uh, the skies look like this. I mean, typically we see uh, images that have been set for very light foreground, but if you're on the dark side, the stars, I've, I've seen some astronauts say that the sky actually looks three-dimensional. You can get a sense 
that some things are further away than, uh, than you can uh, just looking at an image. And then the colors of the various stars without the twinkling of the atmosphere. So uh, being able to look out as well as down adds another dimension to the ride. This is time-lapse time lapse from ISS of very active thunderstorms. Always like a thunderstorm as long as I'm inside the house, safe, safely behind the glass and walls. So being able to see one from space would be really cool. And then you've got uh, mountaintops uh, and valleys to look at. Here are the pyramids in Egypt. Uh, on, on orbit, you might want to take a spacewalk, or if, if you're not quite that enthusiastic, maybe they could just open the hatch and let you stand in the hatchway looking out at Earth and what's beyond. And these are images at night <clears throat> of New York City, Long Island, Atlanta. See that G? That's where I am in Greenville, South Carolina. <clears throat> Seen at night. I can, I'm sure you can figure out Spain and Italy. So being able to look back at the Earth uh, at night. Oh, by the way, can you tell which image, uh, which part of this image is South Korea and North Korea? Look to the right. I'll give you a close up. There you go. North Korea, totally dark. South Korea, lighted like that. <clears throat> what nation? India. China on the right. Terry Virtus did a really nice presentation I saw a couple of years ago of his experiences uh, on orbit. <clears throat> That's Africa, South America. Lightning storms from space. There are these phenomena <clears throat> sprites, gigantic jets. Uh, these occur above thunderstorms. These are images taken from Earth looking up above a thunderstorm, and you can see the red sprites. These are images taken from orbit of the sprites. So this is an interesting phenomenon. And these are time lapse. <clears throat> so I think they're a little bit more you know, compressed in terms of their uh, impressiveness. <clears throat> then I want to share one more thought with you uh, gymnastics in weightlessness. And this was illustrated so beautifully by the Skylab missions. And here's a little video that shows what you can do if you are in weightless condition with enough room to move around. The space station is open for business. Over the next eight months, Skylab is home to three crews, each setting new records for astronauts living and working in space. You fly from one side to the other. We had erected handrails in there to move along. You don't do that. You don't use any of that stuff. Uh, I can remember the first week or so, I'd do flips on the way. The feeling of being Peter Pan, of being your own spacecraft flying around the Earth is awesome and, 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 and incredible. We were zipping around there as if we had never been other than weightless. 
I don't know about you, but that looks really cool to me <clears throat> to be able to do that without fear of having to fall. So I would trust that somebody who designs our orbiting hotels puts a space like this in them so that our intrepid tourists will be able to do these kinds of stunts and enjoy weightlessness. I must say though, <clears throat> I haven't seen one design yet that incorporates a space like that. Pretty cool stuff. So I would hope uh, over to a hotel has a, a, a dome area uh, large enough. If it's got atmosphere, you might actually be able to fly like a bird. And then of course, there's the idea that uh, if we can see Earth from, from orbit, uh, that it changes our perception of, uh, of Earth. And uh, no borders, fragile environment, and that perhaps we need to take better care of our little spaceship. So I think that's where I'd like to end. See if there are any questions, Bert. Fabulous, Bill. Uh, why don't you uh, stop sharing your screen? Okay. And yeah, a lot of I think there were a number of comments and questions, but why don't I start off with just one that's more personal to you? How did you get interested in documenting this history? It's it's a it's a fascinating thing and obviously uh, well researched. But I was just wondering what was the impetus for you? Well, I, I've been involved with the museum profession for forty two years. I've been retired for ten. Uh, during that time, I was director of four different institutions, two of which had planetariums. So I was always supportive of the astronomy portion of the mission of those institutions. And I was the curator for a very large traveling exhibit called Space Toys. We traveled it around the country from Little Rock, Arkansas for six years. It took an entire seminar, semi uh, truck, a 50 foot truck. It was a 3000 square foot exhibit that uh, depicted making, making use of toys, uh, themes from Star Wars, Star Trek, and so forth. So it's just been part of my life uh, from the very early time when I grew up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, with uh, the space launches just up the coast a little bit uh, coming off the Cape. Great. Uh, in terms of all your research that you did and what you showed this evening, is there anything that is your favorite? I mean, you showed so many fascinating things, but I was just wondering if one of them stands out to you. Well, I guess that 1901 Buffalo exhibition, uh, the, the scope of that experience is so amazing considering how they utilize the technology to create the feeling of that trip. I mean, you really have to go to 1955 at Disney to even begin to approach it. And I, I don't think it was what, what that trip to the moon at Disney was not as compelling as what they created in 1901. So I find that really fascinating. <clears throat> Two gentlemen uh, came together to create that <clears throat> and uh, they raised the money for it. They designed it and they had it built. Uh, and it's, I think it's just exceptional. Uh, what they were able to accomplish. Wow. Uh, by the way, one of the comments in the chat was one of the uh, our, our viewers tonight uh, is a student from Buffalo. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so perfect timing. <laughs> uh, one last question before I get to uh, some of the questions that have been submitted. Uh, you know, it's it's really interesting to see the you know, the concepts that people had who maybe weren't even scientists or engineers uh, and how they recreated what they th thought space would be like or what they thought the moon would be like. Uh, I know you said, of course, that sometimes they got it really wrong, but I'm always thinking about um, Martin Cooper, who was the uh, engineer at Motorola 
who created the first cell phone. And if you ever remember that uh, show that, you know, William Shatner, how William Shatner changed the world, you know, supposedly he saw the communicator in on Star Trek. And that was one of the things that kind of led him to the creation of the of the cell phone. Do you see what was presented, uh, in, you know, in, in some of these amazing concepts, how it might have actually influenced uh, the engineers who have put us into space, like you mentioned that one shot that looked very similar to the, the you know, Saturn V leaving the VAB. And, uh, you know, and so, and of course, that amazing image that you, that you had comparison of the Apollo 11 landing uh, and Jules Verne's uh, spacecraft coming splashing down. So just wondering if you've thought a little bit about that. Well, I, I have some uh, examples. <clears throat> the, uh, the German Nazi uh, rocketeers who developed the uh, V2, uh, almost to a man, were inspired by that 1929 German film, Woman in the Moon, hmm. uh, to the extent that they actually put a logo on the rockets that they were firing, uh, honoring that particular uh, film. Uh, it was a little risque. It was a, a, a woman not very well clad, uh, sitting on a crescent moon. Uh, and uh, they had this uh, tradition of putting these uh, logos, just like people would paint uh, images on uh, bombers during World War II. Uh, they would do that with their rockets. And that movie was so inspirational to them that they actually honored it uh, on that, uh, on, on the first, first rocket that truly uh, went into uh, the upper atmosphere. Uh, also, um, uh, Robert Goddard uh, said that he was inspired uh, to travel or think about traveling uh, off of the planet uh, by reading uh, War of the Worlds. Uh, so the future begins in our imagination and wherever science fiction and illustrations and cinema and so forth uh, can, uh, can take our imaginations, we're certainly then in a better position to create that world. By the Absolutely. way, my presentation tonight did not include radio, television, the mm. games, you know, the computer games of today. So there's, there's a whole other level or layer of technology that's been used to take us to these distant places. Absolutely fabulous. Let me get a few questions that were submitted. Uh, Aiden, who is that actually the student from Buffalo, uh, what is your opinion of Giordano Bruno? Was he significant to early space tourism and modern, modern philosophy? I do not know anything about him. We should ask, ask our visitor to tell us. I don't know that. Okay, but maybe we can, very good. And got another question that you kind of, in a way, answered this, but uh, this is from Carl. How accurate were the artist's rendition of their of their subjects? And in in some cases they were right, in some cases they weren't. <laughs> well, Ches Chesley Bonstell <clears throat> said that he was embarrassed that the moon didn't look like what he had painted. <laughs> if you look at certain astronomical images of the moon, it looks like the peaks are very pointed. And it's just a phenomena that as the moon, as the sunlight rakes across the moon's surface, uh, it can cause shadows that have very strong peaks. Right. So he was, he was going with the shadowing, just turned out not to be accurate. They were still spectacular images, no doubt That's about it, right? Yeah. That's right. Uh, another question from Carl. Uh, well, you didn't, like you said, you didn't talk about radio or television, but uh, the, what value were the comics of Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon? Oh, I, I think uh, tremendous. Certainly, uh, uh, Flash Gordon was the first to go into the cinema with the uh, serial. Uh, they did three serials that were um, Buck Flash Gordon. And then Buck Rogers came uh, after, after Flash Gordon had run. And it turned out Buster Crab was the lead in both. 
uh, Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers. Um, but remember that both of them appeared in Sunday Funnies and dailies in black and whites. And uh, I, I have a little quote from Ray Bradbury that as a, as a youth, he looked forward to receiving the, the newspaper and picking up these adventures uh, each Sunday. Uh, and that was back when uh, Buck Rogers was the entire page of a tabloid instead of being what we have today crammed into small space on the Sunday funnies. Right, right. Uh, let me get a few others in there. Uh, again, question from Aiden. One of the photos had the word Berlin on the bottom. Was that taken near, in or near Berlin? Do you recall which image that was? No, I don't remember that. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I'll look at that one. And this one's actually one you could probably uh, talk about because of your experience at museums. Uh, uh, how do planetarium shows fit into space tourism? Well, they fit very well. And, and I must confess, I'm somewhat embarrassed that I didn't get to include them. I do have two books on the history of planetarium. Uh, planetariums at first, uh, back in the 20s and 30s, uh, pr produced the typical night sky shows, which were wonderful, you know, what you could see in the current night sky. But um, the Fells Planetarium um, in, in Philadelphia and the Hayden in New York, uh, by the late 40s and into the early 50s, started to produce thematic shows like A Voyage to the Moon or Beyond. And uh, those theme shows uh, started to use special effect projectors that could uh, project images that would move on the dome. And uh, you know, I find my, my, my first planetarium experience was at the Hayden Planetarium in New York. And uh, the, when they turned the cove lights on, the dome seemed to open and the stars came out at night. It was, it was just a fantastic experience that uh, I'm sure all of our viewers uh, have, have, has, have had since then. So planetariums would be another whole media that could be illustrated as a way of traveling to these distant places. Right. Um, let's see, do you have any opinion about George Powell's Destination Moon? Uh, I, 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 that's what I showed you a little bit right. of, uh, of that. I think it's a, a wonderful film. I mean, it has its quirky places, but 1950, this was 1950. And I would say that it did exceptionally well at uh, taking us to the moon, taking us on a great adventure, uh, and, and at the same time being quite entertaining. Very good. You talked about the future hotels in space. Uh, are you aware of what companies are interested in setting up uh, orbiting hotels? Um, I can't tell you the names, but I know there are three or four that have been discussed, some of which you know, they, they put out these rather outlandish illustrations, and I just wonder what they hope to gain, because it doesn't look like they're really feasible. Uh, but I'm sure that there are companies that are being more realistic in their, uh, in their interpretation of, of what might be possible. Right. We had a great session uh, a few weeks ago on the different uh, platforms that are being planned for low Earth orbit. And I remember asking one of the presenters, because the images they showed uh, of the inside of the space stations were so clean. And compared to when you look at the International Space Station and you see all the cabling and ducting and so on. And I said, are they really going to be able to do something like that? Because you have to be able to maintain all these things or you can't rip out walls. Uh, so so it was just interesting, you know, in, in thinking about that as you presented your your, the image of Skylab and the astronauts jumping around and spinning and doing gymnastics. And, you know, what are some of these hotel or, you know, that space tourists will go to, what will they look like inside? So just yeah, interesting. Some of the images I've seen have these outlandishly large spaces. Uh, now, if you want to have one space like that, like a Skylab, but the idea that your hotel room would be, uh, you know, <laughs> couple hundred square feet uh, is, is just not going to happen. You put a window in the wall, 
and, and you don't need a big space because you've got space to look out at. You've got the right. earth to look out at. So I think, I think that sometimes the artists who are presenting the ideas of what it might be like aren't getting enough guidance from the technical people. Right, right. Uh, let me see if what's in the chat. There were a few things in the chat. Uh, and I think a number of people uh, put in their favorite movies. So if you want- Oh, if good, you want, yes. <laughs> uh, Interstellar seems to be a big, a, a big one. Yes. Uh, of their favorite space movies. Let me see if I can see some of the others there. Let's see. I'm a little trouble. There we go. Yeah, Interstellar, first Star Trek movie. Uh, another Interstellar. Oh, Forbidden Planet. Robinson Crusoe on Mars. <laughs> so a good list. Yes, yeah, so I just purchased Robinson Crusoe on Mars, and I'm intending to watch it in the next week or two. Uh, and someone asked in, in the Q and A, "What's your favorite space movie?" Oh gosh, my favorite probably probably Forbidden Planet or 2010. The first half of 2001, I really like. I uh, the psychedelic part doesn't do much for me, <clears throat> but but uh, certainly 2001 and the use of music. Uh, the Blue Danube Waltz has never been the same since I saw that. Uh, that's it's right. Cool. Fabulous opening. Yes. Okay. Uh, what type of space tour would you personally like to take? Well, I'm going to be 80 in August. So I think my space touring time's probably finished. Uh, I would like to, uh, I would like to go down to Disney World again and uh, see the, um, take, take the rides associated with um, um, the uh, the new movie uh, is escaping my. Uh, anyway, redo revisit those rides down there. Right. Oh, Avatar, Avatar. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, I'd like, Sounds I'd like, good. But but I'm not sure I want to stand in line to accomplish that either. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll try to get, I know there were quite a few questions about uh, the future of space tourism as people are, it's, this is a topic that certainly resonated with everybody. Do you think there were, uh, in terms of looking at your, at the culture and the science, uh, any lessons learned that could be, that could benefit uh, designers of these future habitats for space tourists? Well, I, I think I shared with you the scale um, right. to have a, a space that like like the Skylab that you can really move around in. Um, it would be nice to think that they could bring the price down a bit, um, and and not not just be for uh, people who can spend uh, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to to go into suborbital or millions of dollars to go into orbital. But I guess time will tell whether it can be brought down to something that uh, more reasonably priced uh, experiences. We'll see. Yep, I think there were a number of questions about the cost, and I think that was great you touched on it. Let me ask uh, one of our uh, attendees. This is the student from Buffalo who wants to. He raised his hand. So, okay. uh, Aiden, I'm going to allow you to ask your question, and I think you're going to have to unmute first. There you go. Go ahead. I have a two-part question. Uh, part one, who is your inspiration and why? And part two, uh, is there any notable uh, Greek, ancient Greek philosophers related to this subject? Thank you. you, you you've gotten beyond my knowledge base. Um, I, I would have to look up both of those, uh, certainly the Greek philosophers. Um, in, in terms of well, I, I do a class here, a uh, course on searching for extraterrestrial life through science and science fiction. And it is pointed out that uh, the Greeks uh, had the idea that the gods lived on the mountains surrounding uh, and, and in, in the Greek area. Uh, so the idea that the gods live on Mars or beyond uh, might have evolved from that. Um, and then, of course, you have Holtz, the planets, which, although it was astrology, 
uh, it has taken on a, a, a meaning of its own and you certainly listen to Mars and, and so forth and uh, can be inspired by that music. Very good. I want to get a couple more questions, uh, Bill. Uh, we're a little bit over time, but that's okay. If you're good for take a, a couple more that were in the uh, Q&A. Okay, as long as my battery holds out. I'm, okay, we'll try I'm to get through these real quick then. We'll take two more uh, from the list here that uh, okay. uh, John is asking, uh, and this you might this might be really uh, appropriate for you. Uh, if a space enthusiast has been collecting memorabilia for a lifetime, what would your recommendations be for a donation of the collection to allow preservation and enjoyment of the items? Wow, okay. Well, I'm in the process of distributing my collection to six different institutions. And uh, I, I have been surprised to find that there isn't a great number of institutions that want the stuff. Hmm. And I've got Star Wars, Star Trek. I mean, I've got thousands of things that are toys, print material, comic books, magazines, and so forth. <clears throat> so I've identified six institutions that I'm dispersing it to. Uh, and I have a friend who's helping me take the Star Wars stuff. And I must have maybe 500 Star Wars characters still on their cards. And he's taken them and divided them into the movies. And then we're creating packages of them that can then be used to recreate memorable scenes from the films. And then that will be given to these institutions to use as hopefully they see fit. I am working with a local history museum uh, for an exhibit this summer that will make use of my toys. Uh, and it's going to explore how the American Western, the novels, the Lone Ranger, so forth and so on, became a template for space adventure such as Buck Rogers, and Flash Gordon. It's not an idea that's new to me, it's one that I read, but what we're doing is telling the story through a combination of toys, games, uh, comic books, and other uh, material. Very good. Yeah, you would think it would be uh, something that uh, museums want, but they have got lot, they already have a lot in their collections, right? So you know, where do you store everything and how do you, you know, there's uh, obviously costs associated with taking on big collections. Yeah, well, one institution that I'm working with is still trying to figure out just how much they can take. Right. So they're rearranging their collection area to decide. And we've worked out sort of a, a way of measuring volume. And the, and they I'm waiting for them to come back and tell me how much they, they want. They're going to send a, two, of, two of their staff up here uh, to uh, select from my collection. Uh, they're going to drive a truck up from Florida to do that mm -hmm. in April. Very good. Uh, last question that we'll take for tonight uh, is, uh, what did you think of the film A Rendezvous in Space that was shown at the 1964 World's Fair? Did you see that one? I, that would be the 64-65 New York. 64-65, yes. Uh, I... I, I don't, I mean, other than what I showed with the three-dimensional rendezvous and docking, I don't know of a film. So I guess I missed that. If there was a film also, uh, I missed that. But three-dimensional docking took place above people's heads. And then there was a, a, a screen that projected images that went along with that. But, um, but I don't know of another one, but there very well might've been another one. Right. Well, sounds good, Bill. Uh, one last question from me. What's next in terms of your your uh, your presentations? What do you think you're going to be doing next? Wow. <laughs> so we can schedule you. Just <laughs> I'm just looking ahead. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I could actually do a presentation on real space tourism, uh, Virgin Galactic, and so forth, if that would be. Oh, well, maybe we'll take Certainly you up on that. that. Yeah, that sounds great. I well, like that. Yep, yeah, Larry's in agreement. Okay. So, Bill, thanks so much. That was just a fabulous uh, presentation. The 
you know, the, your ability to bring the, uh, the graphics and photos and illustrations into it and tell uh, an amazing story. So we really thank you for taking the time to not just to put it together, but to present with such uh, enthusiasm. So thank you so much for that. Uh, as always, uh, I would like to thank my two colleagues, uh, uh, Larry Ahern, my VP of Chapters, and Fred Becker uh, for all the work he does in support of the tech for our space forums. Uh, it was a really enjoyable presentation tonight. So thanks, Bill. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Fred. Uh, what I'm going to do, everybody, is uh, share my screen one last time. Uh, and so that we'll be able to close things out. If I can just get that to work here, uh, it would be good. <laughs> Sometimes the tech. There we go. And thanks, everybody, again, for participating tonight. Here we go. Yep, there it is. So we really appreciate your attendance this evening. Uh, we will hopefully see you again in two weeks. Uh, look for some more invites. Uh, and also, hopefully, we'll have a, a, a more detailed schedule for what's coming up next. So thank you. Uh, for those of you in these time zones, have a great evening. Uh, for those of you in tomorrow, have a great day and weekend. And everybody, have a great weekend ahead. As always, stay safe. Thank you for joining us. Everyone, have a good evening. <laughs>